Okay, so I'm going to say welcome everyone. Um, it's good to see you all. Uh, my name is Dina Caswell. I'm the Supervisor of Outreach and Diversity for the Cherry Hill Public Library. Very excited to welcome you to today's event. So today, um, we are here with uh, Imagine Your Life Story, a discussion on memoir writing with Carol Harkavy and Stephanie Milan. Um, this event is part of our summer reading program. So for more information, you can visit www.chplnj.org slash SRP 2020. Let me see, there we go. Um, so we are in the middle of summer reading. Our summer reading runs until August 15th this year. I encourage all of you, if you're interested, to please um, visit us at chplnj.readsquared.com. Um, you can log all of your reading. And for this summer, that means all of the reading that you're doing. We have a lot of fun events um, and other projects that you can do from the comfort of your own home. For participating in events like tonight's event, you can enter a code to earn more points and win lots of fun prizes at the end of the summer. Tonight's code is memoir. Um, we also have, so we have two fantastic lo local authors here tonight. Um, we also have two really exciting upcoming author events. Uh, tomorrow night, we have Ann Napolitano, a uh, New York Times bestselling author who wrote Dear Edward. That's been a big, buzzy hit this summer. Uh, she's coming tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Um, August 24th, uh, Robert Kolker, another New York Times bestselling author, is coming to visit us to talk about his new book, Hidden Valley Road, which, again, a New York Times bestseller. Lots of people have been talking about it. We're really excited to welcome him back. So you can visit our events calendar at chplnj.org to register for these events. Uh, and we also encourage you to work with our partner, Inkwood Books in Haddonfield. Uh, they will get both copies of these books to you in a variety of ways, curbside, through the mail, and they will have signed copies available. So I encourage you um, to visit them and, and patronize their business. Uh, so for tonight's event, um, for best viewing, uh, put yourself in speaker view. It'll be at the top right corner of your Zoom screen and remain muted. And then that way you'll just see Stephanie and Carol. Feel free to submit questions at any time using the chat box to your right. Um, when we reach the Q&A portion of the event, I will bring your, your questions to Stephanie and Carol. Um, and this event is being recorded. So we will upload this to the Cherry Hill Public Library YouTube channel. Please tell your friends and anyone who couldn't make it with us tonight. So that is enough for me and I'm gonna turn things over to Carol and Stephanie. Right. Let Thank me introduce you. Carol and Stephanie, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I will say, <laughs> uh, Carol is a native New Yorker and has been living in Cherry Hill for the past 10 years. She graduated from the City College of New York where she later became a tenured instructor in the speech department. After marrying her high school sweetheart, she moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, where she received her Master of Arts degree in speech and communications. In 2018, she fulfilled a lifelong dream and published her memoir, Rosie and Me, about the unbreakable bond she enjoyed with her mother, who suffered from a lifetime of physical ailments and perpetual pain. It is available on Amazon in paperback and on Kindle. An audiobook version will be available shortly. Uh, we also have a copy at our library in the local author's collection. Uh, you can follow Carol's blog on her website, rosieamemoir.wordpress.com. One of the ways Carol loves to share Rosie's story is by discussing Rosie and book clubs. Contact Carol at rosie.memoir at yahoo.com to arrange her participation in your book club. Carol is currently working on her second memoir, Vignettes on Life, Reflections on the Life of a Septuagenarian. Uh, and then Stephanie, has, Stephanie Milan has published five self-help books and children's books under her name and an adult mystery fiction series under the pen name R.A. Milan. She graduated from Rutgers University Camden with high honors, an English degree, and the Betty Harris Jones English Department Award. Her search for spiritual truth began in 2010 when she immersed herself in a host of spiritual teachings. The tragic loss of her mother forced her to create a new version of herself, but she's always evolving, as is her writing. When she's not writing or traveling, her free time is spent studying books about metaphysics, psychology, the brain, alternative healing, and spirituality. She tries to bring an element of all she has learned into her writing and author coaching. Stephanie just completed her first memoir and is now working on a new series. 
She resides in Cherry Hill where she lives with her husbands, her rescued cats, and her dog. So now I can officially pass it over to Carolyn <laughs> for joining us tonight. Well, thank you so much, Dina, for your interest in promoting local authors by inviting Stephanie and me here tonight to share our thoughts and our insights on memoir writing. We're delighted to be here. My name is Carol Harkavy, and at the tender age of 72, a month before my 73rd birthday and one week before Mother's Day, I published my first book, a memoir called Rosie and Me. It was the thrill of a lifetime. After decades of talking about completing my memoir, I finally bit the bullet and published it. But what took me so long? The thought of publishing was daunting. Do I try to get an agent or do I self-publish? So I kept reverting back to the comfort zone we all know as procrastination. All the while feeling self-doubt, uncertainty, insecurity, and lack of confidence. Then about two years before my book was published, I was walking around the quaint, historic small town of Haddonfield, New Jersey, New Jersey, where I lived at the time, and there was a craft fair going on. And I happened upon a table where a young woman was selling a book that she had just recently published. I started talking to this young woman, and after talking with her for probably an hour, I said to her with all sincerity, you are so smart to have published a book in your 20s rather than waiting until you were in your 70s like I am wishing that you had published a book. To tell you the truth, I had no idea what to expect in return. The response I got was definitely not the one that I could have ever imagined. Stephanie, rather than as some young people would do with an older person, rather than being kind and smiling politely, she looked me straight in the eye and said, well, why don't you? I'll tell you how I did it. Well, I always embarrass Stephanie by calling her my guardian angel, but true to her word, over the next two years until the book was published, she held my hand and walked me through all of the stages of publishing my book. When I felt discouraged or unmotivated, she pumped me up with motivation. And because of her, and because of her encouragement and the advice that she gave me, I got over the finish line. Now, not everybody in life is going to be lucky enough to meet Stephanie. But I have very good news for you. She has compiled all of her thoughts and ideas and suggestions and exercises into a book that she has published called Oh the Stories You Will Write, a motivational guide to empower aspiring authors. And with that, I'd like to turn the, this presentation over to Stephanie. Well, thank you so much, Carol. And hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Milan. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you to Dina and the Cherry Hill Public Library for hosting this. And thank you for Carol for asking me to participate in this discussion with you. Um, Carol, your Rosie and Me is a phenomenal book. I love it. I've read it a number of times and, and it just is wonderful. So I wanted to point that out to anyone. If you haven't read it yet, definitely read it. Um, I've published seven books of various genres, and I currently have my eighth book, which is my own memoir, Out with Agents, and I'm working on a series, as um, Dina mentioned in the beginning. But one of the passions that I have in addition to writing is to empowering other authors with motivational ideas, tips, and tools to help them not only finish their books, because that's one of the things that most authors have trouble with, but also to find the right avenue to publish their books, which is, there are so many choices today, what do you do? So that's really what Oh The Stories You Will Write is all about. Um, I'm really thankful to have Carol as my writing buddy. We have a writing group that meets 
um, every Monday. I know Debbie's on here, so she's in it as well. And one of the things that's so great about this writing group is that we keep each other on track with our projects and we keep each other motivated to finish those projects. So I highly recommend if you don't have a writing group right now that, um, that you have one in the future. And, and sometimes it takes a while to find those people that you trust enough. Um, Carol and I have come from different backgrounds. We've had different experiences with writing, but our passion is the same. And what's really cool about tonight is that in a setting like this with two people with two unique different experiences, uh, we can both offer the valuable lessons that we've learned um, from two different perspectives. And hopefully we'll get to answer all of your questions as well. So if we can't, uh, don't address something that we will be answering that in the question portion. So anyway, I know we plan on having a great discussion this evening, and I know that Carol has some great advice that she would like to offer aspiring writers. So Carol, what is some advice you'd like to offer someone who's writing a memoir or any book right now? Well, my number one piece of advice to anyone interested in writing a memoir or creating any other work of art is this. Do not let anyone or anything discourage you by their negative feedback. Now, some people may just off the cuff, haphazardly, thoughtlessly say something without thinking, and that can sometimes throw you over the edge. Many years ago, when Rosie and me was in its early stages of development, it was really a passing dream. I registered for a class through a group called Media Bistro, appropriately called memoir writing. I paid my $150 registration fee and drove into New York City filled with hope and anticipation. It was held in the instructor's opulent Upper East Side apartment and for those of you who know Manhattan, that is like the place to live in Manhattan. Her living room was filled to capacity with aspiring memoir writers. Each of us was to read a three minute excerpt from the manuscript that we were working on. I'm going to read for you what I read. This will comprise the first and last paragraph of the prologue of Rosie and me. <clears throat> Brooklyn, New York, June 24th, 1944. We are getting ready for the wedding. Rosie is, is bustling around her apartment as quickly as a woman expecting a baby at any moment can. It is her oldest brother's wedding and she does not want to be late. It is while dancing that I made a nuisance of myself and started kicking and carrying on, making it clear that we were not hanging around for dessert. I was ready to enter this world and I could not be kept waiting. We only had to go a little over a mile, a mere five minute, minutes by cab to Madison Park Hospital, where we were supposed to meet Rosie's obstetrician. Dr. Michelson for what should have been a routine delivery, but he was either unavailable or unreachable. So we were literally in the hands of the intern on call that night. Unfortunately, he probably had not yet completed his obstetrics rotation and because he was either too uncertain or too frightened to deliver a baby, he prevented a normal delivery by pushing my head in with his hand while my mother was desperately trying to push me out. The young intern was hoping that Dr. Michelson would get to the hospital in time for the delivery, so he forcibly held me back until the doctor's arrival. When she realized what was happening, Rosie screamed at the intern, what are you doing? Do not harm my baby. At that moment, Dr. Michelson arrived. And after assessing the situation, he gravely told my father, the baby is gone. 
pray for your wife. But nothing would interfere with the welfare of her baby. My mother fought with all her strength to make sure that we both survived. Our lifelong bond, inadvertently strengthened by the hand of a frightened intern, was created at that very moment. And there was never a time thereafter that I would not have laid down my life for her, nor she for me. Now, the response that I got from the participants in the memoir class were quite positive. Many of them nodded, a lot of them smiled, some even applauded quietly. However, following the reading, I got a response from the instructor that came out of left field. She started throwing questions at me. What was so extraordinary about your mother? Was she in the Holocaust? Did she invent anything? Did she write a book or paint a famous painting? Did she do anything that made her special? Well, I was pretty unsure of myself to begin with about writing a memoir, and this totally threw me over the edge. Easily discouraged, I put Rosie on the back burner, filled with the desire to publish a book, but lacking the courage and determination to do so. It took me many years to come to the realization that Rosie may not have accomplished any of the things that would make her famous, but in fact, she was very special and her story deserved to be told. She was what some might classify as ordinary, but in actuality, she was a most extraordinary woman and I felt compelled to write her story. Everybody has a story to tell. Don't think that your st story is not worth telling. I used to go to the library in a defeatist kind of an attitude and look at all of the books, thousands of books, and say to myself, why do they need another book? One time I took a class and I said to the instructor, why does anybody want to read a memoir? And he looked at me and smiled and he said, don't kid yourself. People love reading about other people's lives. So everybody has a story to tell. What may seem familiar and ordinary and mundane to you will be eye-opening and exciting to your readers. Do not become discouraged because you think that it will take a year or two or five to complete your memoir. About 150 years ago, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, life is a journey, not a destination. And just as a little aside for my grandchildren who are all watching, no, I did not go to school with Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's important to get satisfaction just from the act of writing. I personally find it very cathartic. And so for those of you who lament that it may take a year to complete your memoir, just remember this, that year is going to pass by anyway. So you may just as well have a memoir to show for it. You know, Carol, I really like what you said and, and I'd like to offer my perspective on the advice that you gave um, before we get into the methodology of writing a memoir. You said, do not let anyone or anything discourage you by their negative feedback. So I write about this in my book, first how to combat your own inner demons while writing a book, because we definitely, as writers, we combat that even to get started sometimes. Um, we can be our own worst enemies while working on a project. Uh, we can judge ourselves too harshly. We have inner critics that are constantly talking to us. We stay in comfort zones because of fear. Um, we use perfectionism as a way not to finish our projects and it really stifles our progression but other people also play a role in this for us because they can say something to us and just like you had said we can choose to 
accept that and believe that. So what I want to talk about is something that may be helpful to you as you take this journey into writing this memoir or any creative work that you're doing. There's a huge difference between criticism and constructive criticism. So true criticism is meant to lift and better your project in some way. It's somebody's opinion, but it's somebody who either has expertise in the field that you're working in or is someone that you trust who reads your work and has an idea that will lift and better it. And I'll give you an example in a couple minutes, but the thing about constructive criticism is that it's not negative and it is not emotional. It doesn't put down your work and it is, uh, it's not rooted in envy or pain or belief systems. This is really important to remember as you write, whether you're beginning to write, you're in the middle of your book or you're at the end of it. When you publish your book, when you're reading reviews about your book, anywhere along your journey, please remember the difference between constructive criticism and regular criticism. Constructive criticism is the only opinion that we should ever listen to when it comes to our work. So when someone remarks on our work, the first question we should ask ourselves is, is this constructive? Is this helping my project in some way? Is this intended to help my project in some way? And this is a skill that you have to, to build over time. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Let's say you send your book out to an agent and they decide they're not going to publish your book. But they say, hey, uh, you know, your book was great, but given the amount of books that are published in this genre, here's how you can make your book more unique. That's constructive. Um, they read your book, they gave it the time and attention, and they told you something great about it. Um, it's not emotional, it's, it's uplifting. Another example I have is uh, Carol read my memoir before I started sending it out. And there was one passage in there. Um, I, I wrote about my tragic experience with losing my mom and my memoir is more of a personal growth story. So it is told chronologically because it starts from the incident that happened and then continues through my personal growth. And I had a very difficult time with, with doctors, with my mother, and I wrote about this experience. And one of the chapters that I had in there, Carol read, and she was like, I just feel like this is too much. Like, I feel like you should remove this chapter. And I really sat with that for a while because I believe in writing everything, you know, writing your emotions exactly as you are, as they are, because you can always take it out later, but you really need to get all of that out. So um, I sat with that for a while and I was like, that's constructive. That is constructive criticism. It's intended to better my project and it resonates with me. And so if something that someone you trust or someone who's an expert resonates with you, you should definitely take that advice. However, um, sometimes two people who are either an expert or people that you trust will give you two different opinions. Because remember all, constructive criticism is still an opinion. And so um, you have to ask yourself, well, which one of these resonates with me more? So that's something that I, I wanted to point out about constructive criticism. Now, the other side of that is just plain criticism. And that's something that's really um, contagious today for some reason, especially in this time. Uh, people are berating people on, on Amazon and all different places for their creative works. And you see it all the time. And there are social platforms that are really, um, you know, they're, they're allowing this to happen. And it's really kind of sad to watch. But if you learn how to notice what's constructive and what's just criticism, you're not going to uh, be affected by it as much. As writers, you guys are writing about probably the most sensitive topics when you're writing about memoirs. And so you're telling your story or you might be telling someone else's story. So for you, it's especially important to know that the person remarking on your work, whether they're, they're just giving you their self-limiting beliefs about writing or about publishing, or if they're giving you true constructive criticism. So, um, we know this for some reason, we, we know that, and I can say it to you, but for some reason when it happens, we still 
um, get caught up in that. And that's where I say like, we deal with this all the time as writers, especially with our own inner demons. One book I can highly recommend to help you through this journey is The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, if you haven't read it yet, because um, he really helps you kind of um, feel better about, you know, not taking things personally, not assuming things. So I highly recommend that book. You would definitely gain some strength from that. With memoir writing, we want to be as authentic as possible. And we want to be true to ourselves or true to the person that we're telling. And sometimes, I know someone had asked a question about names, and I'm sure uh, we'll get to it. Carol will give a great answer later when we talk about that, but just to briefly touch on it. I know in my memoir, I tried to be as authentic as possible and use people's names. There are some people that I'm not going to use their name. Um, and so I would either uh, change that name or I would talk to that person and say, like, can I use your name? Um, but I do try to be as authentic as possible. And I'm sure Carol will, will talk about that for, with her own memoir later. But um, Carol, you spoke about your experience in your memoir class. And it's so funny. It reminded me of an experience I had when I was pursuing acting before I realized that I actually wanted to be a writer instead. So I went to this <laughs> well-known casting director's audition class and I participated in it. And you'd think that I would have been ecstatic because he told me that I had the talent, I could go far, um, I was great at it, and that I had the skill and if I wanted it, I could have it all. But I was appalled because there was a gentleman in my class who was very nervous and he got up there and he flubbed. And this casting director pulled him in front of the entire class and he said to him, you don't have the talent for this. You will never make it in this field. You're terrible. You should never quit your day job. And my heart sank. I was like, what, did, what just happened? What did I just hear? So I pulled this guy aside. I remember I was standing in Philly and I remember I was standing exactly where I was standing. I pulled this man aside and I said, do not let anyone ever tell you that you do not have the talent to do something, that you are not able to accomplish this dream. If this man was constructive, he would have told you how to become better, not that you can't become better. And that's the difference. But the funny part about that is I actually, knew this man's father, and I knew that this father was very, uh, the, the casting director's father, and I knew that the father was very critical of, of this casting director, and that this casting director never really amounted to the actor that he wanted to be, and never really amounted to what his father wanted him to be. So right there you could see there was some sort of psychological projection coming out on from, from this casting director to this poor guy and really shifting his mindset about what he could do. And so it all comes down to believing somebody when they say something to you as well. And the other thing I just wanted to briefly touch on is, Carol, you said do not become discouraged because you think it'll take a year or more to write your memoir. One of the things that I always tell authors is that writing a book is about momentum. So momentum is defined as strength or force gained by a motion or series of events. Building momentum is the key to starting, continuing, and finishing your project. I equate it to driving across country. You want to drive to California from New Jersey. You need to get in the car, you need to fill up the gas tank, you need to turn on the engine, and you need to drive. You can't just sit in your, you know, driveway. <laughs> so um, if you want to get to your end goal, you have to make small action steps and start to build momentum toward that goal. Every time you sit down to write, every time you log your words, every time you write in your journal, every time you sit down, you're taking one action step toward that goal. And life gets in the way, right? We have children, we have um, illness, we have experiences that derail us. We have COVID-19. We have all kinds of crazy things that happen. And we, we put that on the back burner. We do. But pick it up again every free chance that you have and build a little one action step. That's it. 
towards your goal. What happens eventually is that you build so much momentum that you don't need to um, sit down and schedule those times anymore because the project will take over. If you've ever worked on any project, you know eventually that project will take over. And that's when you start to see the finish line with that, with that project. So I just wanted to briefly touch on those and respond to what you said, Carol, before we get into the, the methods of writing. So what method of writing do you most recommend for memoir writers? Whatever method of writing that works for you, that's the method that you should use. There's no right or wrong way. You may choose to present your book chronologically. Not long ago, I read a very sad memoir that was written in diary form by a young man who happens to be the cousin of a friend of mine who I think may be out there, Janice, who sadly had a beautiful little two-year-old girl who was diagnosed with inoperable, uh, an inoperable uh, tumor, cancerous tumor. And for the one year and nine months from the day that she was diagnosed until the day that she tragically died, he wrote a daily entry into this diary. He wrote his emotions, he wrote the doctor's reports, he wrote how the little girl was handling it. And it was a very effective memoir. <clears throat> Your memoir may be centered around a life-changing event. You may move to another city or another country. It may be centered around a marriage, a death, or even a pandemic. Wouldn't it be interesting for us to read a memoir that might have been written by somebody who lived through the pandemic Spanish flu of 1918? Somehow I feel that the emotions and the frustrations and the fears and uncertainty that would be contained in that memoir would reflect how we are all feeling today. I chose to write my memoir based on a woman who inspired me, a woman who was liberated long before it was in vogue, a woman who was determined to be happy and to persevere despite a myriad of physical ailments and perpetual pain. A woman with whom I had an unbreakable bond. That woman was my mother. I've read many memoirs, all effective, and each follows a different format. The main ingredient is that they were all written from the heart, no matter what the format. Now, some people are very structured and they feel that they need an outline. They have to go from no Roman numeral one to two, A to B, and they just need that structure. Other people just start writing from the heart. I've often read that good writers uh, like to read a lot. And I read every memoir that I could get my hands on when I was a teacher at City College in New York, I would have students who would say, well, I don't know how to write, what do I do? And I would tell them that every so often you're going to get a really profound thought in your head. Capture it, and as you see that thought in your head, write it down verbatim, the way the thought is presented. Now, rather than an outline, I drew from journals that I had been keeping since 1988. I actually lifted verbatim a journal entry that is contained in my book. And this one is called A Space for Rosie. <clears throat> On her 75th birthday, I drove my mother to the cemetery to visit my father. He died six and a half months before their 50th wedding anniversary. No gold mementos to celebrate. My father lies to the left of my mother's empty plot. 
To the right is a doctor whose loose dirt shows that he has just arrived. According to the footstone, he was born three days after my father, but lived three years longer. I wonder if he got to celebrate his 50th anniversary. I'm glad there's a doctor next to me, my mother exclaims, in case I don't feel so good. I tell her she better lose some weight because the plot is pretty narrow. Without missing a beat, she retorts, it's okay. I like to sleep on my side anyway, so there'll be plenty of room. So now, almost 12 years after visiting the cemetery, Rosie is resting between the love of her life, her shimshi, and the doctor she never met. I would suggest that you keep a journal. Don't feel that it's too late. It isn't. Start today. If you have children, encourage them to write journals, especially now they are living through history. They can be writing this pandemic that they're living through. Put down your thoughts, your feelings about your life, your emotions. I even suggest that you keep a paper and pencil on your nightstand right next to your bed. Sometimes during the night, in the middle of a dream, you will say something or think of something that is so profound and so powerful, you can't believe the eloquence with which you are saying this thought. Wake yourself up, turn on the light, and write that down verbatim the way you said it in the dream. You may think that you'll remember it in the morning. You won't. You may remember the gist of the topic, but you will not remember the exact wording. And when you feel strong emotions that are in your heart and hear them in your head, write them down immediately. It is almost impossible to recapture these strong emotions later down the road. I know for certain that I could not have possibly recreated the profound feelings of grief that I recorded immediately after my mother's death. What I consider to be the most powerful and emotional part of my memoir was written right after my mother died. The emotions poured from my heart and I could not stop writing. My hand could barely keep up with all of the memories and feelings that were inside my head. I would like to read an excerpt from my book that was written soon after my mother died when the emotions were fresh and raw. My thoughts returned me to the room where my mother's coffin draped with a cloth of blue and white, dominates the surroundings, while the shomer, ritual attendant, continues reciting to Philem, psalms, prayers for the dear departed loved one, who is my mother. I enter with reluctance and trepidation, all so new to me, and I approach her coffin for the first time. I place my hand on top of the blue and white drape and suddenly I begin to caress it as I had caressed my mother so many times in her lifetime. Gently moving my hand over the draped coffin, my mind transcends time and place. I feel a small smile form on my lips as I close my eyes and see my mother, perhaps in heaven, smiling and walking, yes, walking, with none of the physical barriers that prevented her from walking for so many years on this earth. Her hands are straight, with beautiful long fingers, piano player's fingers, as she would often say while admiring the fingers of a new baby. And she is energetic, looking for my father, she is carefree and free, freed from pain, free from the confines of her wheelchair, free from the dependency of others to perform her most private and personal functions. 
freed from medications, exhaustion, fear, the smells and indignity of sickness and loss of control of bodily functions. She is walking and running, just as she had described to me in one of her dreams. She is happy. Unquestionably, she is very happy. She sees my father and cries out with joy. See that man? That's the man I married. My eyes close, my hand moving in circular motions, massaging the coffin as though it were her, reminding me of when I was a little girl and she would ask me to massage her aching back, unable and not wanting to stop. I am immersed in the vision of my mother, unaware of my surroundings, experiencing the joy I feel seeing her so unfettered and free. Any trepidation and reluctance that I might have had when I first approached her coffin are gone. I realize that the rabbi has entered the room. My eyes open and just as one needs to adjust to the light and surroundings when awakening from a deep sleep, I abruptly come back to reality. My mother has died. It is her funeral. She is soon to be buried and I, and, and I am overcome with sadness. Now these profound thoughts may not come at a convenient time for you. You may not be sitting in front of your computer or at your desk with your journal and pencil in front of you. Just grab any piece of paper you can get your hands on. I have written what I consider to be some of my most powerful sentences on the back of a Wegmans receipt. Now I'm from the old school it's only recently that I started using a computer to write. I always use a yellow pad and pencil. But technology has come a long way. And I know that there are many tools that technology offers for people to write their memoir or to do any writing. So Stephanie being younger, having grown up with computers and knowing technology very well, what are some of your ideas on method on writing a memoir? Sure, um, Carol, when you talk, cause you've told me this since the beginning when, when I went through my own experience, <clears throat> I kept journals <clears throat> detailing everything that I went through. So um, I thought just to give people another example of if you're writing it in the moment, or even if you write it after the fact, because even if you write something in the moment, you're always going to go back and edit it because a lot of times when you write it in the moment, it is, it can sometimes be too emotional. <laughs> so you do scale it back a little bit, but I always start with full emotion and then scale back where I need to. But um, this is, this is the, the day that my mother passed. Um, and what's interesting about it is, and I think this happens to a lot of us, we have a lot of insight at the time that we're experiencing something either really terrible or really strange. And that's why it's so cool to get it down at that time. Um, of certainly if you couldn't get it down at that time, and I've had people say to me, it was too painful and I couldn't get it down. It. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it is very cathartic to get it out on paper though. And um, this in particular was, was something that really resonated with me. Um, this chapter is called Mom is Listening. Um, I do not go to visit my mother today. Yesterday was too painful. I knew she would understand that it was much too painful for me. I had shut down emotionally, mentally, and physically, so everyone decided it was best I stay home. I'll take today to balance my emotions, and then I'll be back tomorrow. I can handle it tomorrow, I say. Thankfully, my brother and his wife are with my mom today. My dad is going to the hospital soon, but he wants to make sure I am okay first. At 2 p.m., I take a shower. I can't stop crying. I bang my hands against the shower as my head rests against the wall. I'm calling out to my mom, begging her to come back to me. Not like this, I cry, please, 
please. Suddenly, I have a moment of clarity where I feel I'm being selfish. My mother would do anything for me. She would stay here on earth in this decaying body as long as she had to, just for me. Was it fair that I was begging her to stay in this body when it was no longer working for her? No, it's not fair, I say out loud to myself, mustering all the courage that I could and through a cascade of warm tears in the purest of places, the shower, I say, Mom, I don't want you to suffer anymore. If you want to leave, you can. I love you so much and I just want you to be happy. Even now as I write this, I'm crying because I can remember exactly how it felt to let my mother, my best friend, go. I step out of the shower and get dressed. My dad is standing at the bottom of the stairs crying. What's wrong? I ask. Mommy's gone. Oh, I say, somewhat in shock. Raymond was with her when she passed. My dad is crying and I lose it, but not before thinking, I let her go. I had to, and she listened. So I don't think that I would have been able to quite capture that if I wrote that later on, um, but that was a live journal. And so amazing things can come out of live journals and I, I highly recommend it, uh, exactly what Carol said. Now moving on to the technology part and, and other methods of writing this, this book. Um, so technology can help us complete our projects and some of you are familiar with Google. Some of you are familiar with what it offers and some of you are like, I don't want anything to do with that. And that's okay. Um, I do want to talk about Gmail and Google for a second because um, some of the people who are on here who are very familiar with it, you know that you can create a Gmail account. Uh, this will give you access to Google Drive. And I love working on my projects in Google Drive because they save automatically and you can access them anywhere. But the other cool thing about using Google Drive is if you want to outline your book or create a vision board or even a timeline, they have a bunch of different tools that you can do, use to do this. Now, if you're the traditional, I create a vision board, I know some of you out there are because I know you, <laughs> um, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You can take a wall in your house and put sticky notes and all kinds of cool things up there to create timelines and however you wanna do that. Um, you can also create a Google document, put it into a landscape function. I know some of you out there have also done this. And you can write your book that way also, adding pictures. If you're doing a memoir, hey, you can add real pictures, right? If you're doing a fiction book, you can add fake pictures of who you want your character, characters to be. Um, some people um, want to use, uh, document different different. Um, points in their book. And so you can use Google Sheets for that, which is like an Excel sheet, um, or to put it in the plainest terms, tables with columns and rows. And I use this for um, keeping all of the timeline um, very accurate, but I also use it in my fiction books. If you write a mystery book, you almost have to have something like that because there's so many different uh, moving parts in, in those kinds of books. Um, I also use it for sending my books out to agents because I like to have the first and last name, the name of the agency, and if they've responded to me, have they given me some sort of, you know, constructive criticism that I can use. So I find Google Drive very helpful. Um, and that's just one tool, one way that you can use that to outline your book and to have everything in one place too. And you can write your full document on there as well. Um, you know, right now, if you don't use that you might have to type on a computer, you put a little thumb drive in, you save it. You don't have to do that on Google Drive. It's just right there and it's saved. Um, now let's say at the moment you don't have time to sit down to a computer and write. You don't even have time to get out a journal. The most time that you have is um, you can sit on your back porch with a glass of orange juice and you know for 15 minutes in the morning or maybe you have a lunch break or something at work at your house probably because for most of us are there. Um, you can use a dictation app, which is really cool. Uh, that will allow you to speak your thoughts into this app and it will basically transcribe that into words. And it's not always perfect. You will have to go back and edit that, but it's certainly very convenient. And if you're very busy or you don't have a lot of time, or maybe you're not able to physically write, um, this would be a great app for you instead of sitting at a computer. And Carol, I think you had something to say about that too, right? 
Yeah, uh, the, the uh, recording device is especially good also for people who are physically unable to write. Um, in my mother's instance, uh, toward the end of her life, her, her vision had failed her. Uh, her hands were unusable. And uh, she had a lot of great advice and thoughts. And I think that that would have been a very, very good tool for her to dictate you know, some of her thoughts. So in addition to using that particular uh, dictation device when you don't have much time, it's also especially good for people who themselves might be disabled in some way and are unable to write. Sure, absolutely. So this brings me to how do you get started with your book? Um, as I said before, the goal is to build momentum. So you have to start anywhere to do that. And as Carol mentioned, the method that works best for you is, is the method that you should do. My recommendation is to try everything. Try outlining, both um, writing it down and also using a computer if you can. Try free writing in a journal or also typing on the computer. Try vision boarding, whether it's physical, because one of those things is going to resonate the most with you and help, you, help motivate you each time that you sit down um, and, and start writing. <clears throat> if you have trouble writing a scene, the best advice that I can give you is to use your senses to guide you. So we use our senses to interpret our three-dimensional reality. Um, we use our senses to interpret the world around us. So when we write, uh, we, like to, we like to communicate our feelings by saying, I feel sad or I, I feel unhappy and I, you know, I am angry. That's how we communicate with people. And so when we write, we communicate in that way. And for a memoir, a lot of that is necessary. We need to communicate how we feel um, if we're writing that kind of memoir. But that doesn't necessarily set up a scene. So writing how you feel doesn't necessarily set up a scene. As Carol was reading her passage before, I was paying attention to some of the imagery that she was putting into that about the, the drape you know, um, the, the cloth on the, um, what did you call it, Carol, on the coffin, and you were touching it, and you were caressing it, that, that right there is setting up some imagery. It's making the, the scene more colorful. So how do we do that? You know, experts will tell us, you know, show, don't tell. What we're really doing in a memoir is we're taking our thoughts and feelings, and we're marrying them with our senses and the reactions to our senses. And that creates this colorful scene. So as an example, if you're walking down the street and you see a dumpster and there's trash all over the place and you're explaining to somebody, it smelled so bad, I, it was just so disgusting, that's fine. But if you say, I walked by the dumpster, I immediately started gagging, I doubled over and started vomiting. I know that's really disgusting, but that gives a better picture of how disgusting that, um, that dumpster actually was. So you're creating this colorful scene by using your senses, a sense of smell, and then your reaction to that sense. So if you can marry that with your feelings, you're going to set, uh, create this really colorful, vibrant scene for people. And sometimes it's not easy because I have to just mention one thing. You know, writing this memoir for me was really difficult. It was really difficult. I had to put myself in that scene time and time again. And I know that there are many of the people on here who are trying to write books like that, where you have to put yourself in that scene that you tried to block out for the last 20 years. Now you have to put yourself back in that scene again. It is very difficult, but I will say this, eventually, when you work through that, you just need to start and take the first step. You take that first step, it's painful. The next step is still painful, actually. Maybe the third or fourth or fifth step is still painful, but eventually, just like building momentum, the project takes over, now it becomes a project, and it's a little less painful as you're working on it. So I just wanted to mention that, it just came to me right now because that was my experience, and I know that would be a lot of other people's experience who are, who are um, on this webinar today. So again, set the scene using your senses and the reactions to them. Imagine the smells or what do you think it smelled like during that time, right? Um, pay attention to colors and sights or 
Imagine what sites may have been around at that time. How did objects feel? Did someone, you're talking about recoil after touching something hot. How did a certain food taste? You know, and of course, what sounds were around. This all helps to establish that colorful scene. And lastly, just touching back on technology because it crosses over with what I currently do for my part-time job. I'm a full-time writer. Um, I part-time work in the music business. I work with a lot of different crossover companies that um, in the music industry that are also in the book industry. So that's the Amazons, the Apples, um, CD Baby, whose sister company is Book Baby. And I know a lot of people when they go into a project, the first thing they think is, all right, how am I going to publish this book? Like, at, we all do it. We jump into the book like, we're either like, how do I get started? Or we're like, all right, what am I going to do with the book once it's finished? So I just wanted to put, you don't need to worry about this now. And, and actually, this is a longer conversation. And, and if it's called for, I know Carol and I would be happy to do another workshop about getting into uh, the different kinds of publishing. But I see all the different sides of the industry. And um, a lot of what happens in the music industry also happens in the book industry. So there are technological changes that happen. There are, um, you know, digital comes, you know, digital Kindle books, you know, there's audible books. Um, in the music industry, it was downloads and streams and things like that. And publishing has changed dramatically, especially in the last five years. Um, it, it is just, it keeps changing so much. So one of the things that I just wanted everyone to be aware of is that when these changes happen, it's better to be on the front lines because when they happen, you are able to take your work and um, get it into that new, exciting technology right away. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, just, I just tell everybody, be open-minded and be, be aware of the new technology that's being created, especially now, because all of those tech gurus and all of those inventors were in quarantine for X amount of months, and they were creating. That's what they were doing. They were creating new technology and they were doing all the stuff. So if it's a new way to publish, if it's an on-demand uh, <laughs> program where authors can upload their books and a British gentleman comes on and reads you the book as he sits by a fireplace and it's a special on-demand service for authors, guess what? Partake in that, be a part of that. Um, and the best advice that I can give with that is in 2011, um, I met this man who, told me, do you have your book ready to go on Kindle? And I said, no, I actually didn't publish my first book until 2014. He said, well, my friend just put her book up there and she made $4 million. And I was like, oh, great. This is awesome. Like, I'm going to get my book up there and I'm going to make $4 million. Well, I didn't publish my book until three, three years later. And um, the time that people could make money off of, of Kindle like that was 2008 to 2011. And it was so cool. And I wish I had been on the front end of that, but I wasn't. Um, it of course has, has um, dwindled since because of, you know, becomes a mainstream technology. And then <clears throat> there's a mass market of people that partake in it. So that's why I always say, just, just keep your eye out for the new technologies that come out. And don't, um, don't just say, oh, I'm not gonna use that, you know, because it could be really lucrative for you and it could make you like tons of money or it could give you tons of exposure, which is what a lot of authors want is exposure. So um, that's really what I wanted to talk about with, these, um, with this technology. I know that you had some advice, Carol, for these writers before we get into some questions. So I'm gonna let you take that away. Okay, I would like to say to, those of you who are writing, think of yourself as a writer. Even call yourself a writer. I love that Stephanie said that I'm a full-time writer when I know that she works in the music industry, but she considers herself a full-time writer. So if somebody says to you, what do you do? Just say, I'm a writer. And I tried to put myself into situations where I identified myself as a writer. I took seminars like the one that you're taking right now. I joined the Cherry Hill Public Library's Writers' Roundtable. I said to myself, if I belong to a group called the Writers' Roundtable, then I am, by definition, a writer. Now, they say that good writers read a lot of books, especially in their genre. 
and I read a lot of memoirs and I actually identified with those authors that shared my passion to tell their stories. <clears throat> Except for the Writers' Roundtable, it was not until recently that I joined a writer's group. The encouragement and camaraderie that I find in that group are invaluable for self-definition as a writer and self-confidence in my writing. I truly believe that if I had belonged to a writer's group all those years ago uh, in that posh Upper East Side apartment, that instructor's negative comments would not have affected me as badly as they did. I would have come back to the group, I would have shared the experience with them, and I'm sure that we could have, we would have talked my way out of not feeling so discouraged. <clears throat> so I would strongly suggest that you meet with or talk with even one other person, also a writer, who has the same goals, the same insecurities and the same aspirations as you. I agree. And I think that's great advice. Um, my advice again is to just take one small step every day to build momentum toward finishing your book, whether it's writing in your journal, logging your words, doing an outline, creating a visual picture of a scene, uh, which now you now know you can use different technology to do. Um, I also think your story has a message to the world. And I agree with, with Carol. I think everybody has a story and that you can tell the same subject differently because that's what's cool about being human is that even though you're telling the same story, you're unique and your experience was unique. And so you still tell it differently. Um, what do you want people to remember about you? That's what you have to ask yourself. What is your story? I think of the musical Hamilton and how amazing of a job Lin-Manuel Miranda did in telling someone else's story. You might be telling your own story. You might, it might be about somebody else. I always listen to the one song from Hamilton. It's called My Shot because he's always like, I'm not giving away my shot. And it's, it's so powerful. It's like uplifting. So if you want to be motivated, I highly, highly suggest you listen to that song. But lastly, I, I had the privilege of listening to Kevin Hart, who is a comedian and actor, speak in uh, January of 2020. And little did any of us know that that would be one of the last events that a lot of people would get to go to live. But what he said really, really spoke to me. And I actually wrote about this in my memoir as well. He said, you're always writing the story of your life, whether you're writing the book or you're just living or you're you know, an actor or maybe you're you know, a doctor or whoever, you're still writing a story. And so um, what is the takeaway of who you are? And what do you want people to take away from that story of your life? Like that book that you're writing, what do you want people to take away when it's said and done? And that really spoke to me. It made me think about what was the message that I was trying to send to the world and did I want to, re how did I want to relay that message? So hopefully that speaks to you also. Well, that concludes what I have to say. Carol, do you have anything to add? Well, all I can say is that I'm so glad that I didn't allow that negative experience I had all those years ago in New York uh, uh, force me to abandon my lifelong dream. It almost did. The whole project was almost aborted by the offhand thoughtless comments of one person. And even though I have thoroughly enjoyed the journey, I must tell you that the feel, that the feeling and thrill of exhilaration cannot be compared to anything else when you hold that book published in your hand. It is even more exhilarating to realize that your book has had an impact on others. Soon after the book was published, I received the following personal email from a reader who I didn't know. I read the book, Rosie and Me, and loved it. My mom, also Rosie, passed away three months ago. You put my words on paper for me. I read it a few times and all the quotes. Thank you. There were other reviews that just were so heartwarming. I recently finished reading Rosie and Me for the second time, and I loved it again. 
I felt as if I really got to know Rosie and I truly admire the courageous, loving and caring woman that she was. In spite of her mother's terrible suffering, Carol Harkavy has inspired me with her intelligent, emotional and informative writing. We were so fortunate to have had her discuss her book at our book club meeting. Another person wrote a wonderful memoir, a tribute not only to a special relationship, but to the power of the English language to paint such a complex, inspirational picture in so few words. Rosie and me is under 150 pages. So if any of you want to use it for a book club, I can assure you that all of your participants will read the book. It's not a daunting 600 page book that some book clubs recommend. And lastly, I, want, I was especially heartened to realize that the message of the book transcends gender, age, religion, and culture. This review was written by a middle-aged male physician from India. After reading Carol Harkavy's Rosie and Me, a memoir, I was convinced that mothers are made from the same mold. The memoir is filled with ebullience and poignance, a pure, thorough, and heartwarming journey of courage, love, vulnerability, and comfort, delicately woven to create a blanket of a masterpiece ready to nestle and provide warmth. I could perceive the life of my mother so similar to the life of Rosie, yet born and lived miles apart. So Stephanie and I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Again, I would really like to thank Dina for having invited us to make this presentation. It's truly been a pleasure to be here. Okay, thank you to you both. Um, so thank you to everyone that has submitted questions uh, in the chat. Um, some of you have emailed questions to us in advance. So I would love to ask you and, and you, Carol, and Stephanie both. Um, so Mary had talked uh, a little bit earlier and asked us, how do you know when to use real names or change names in your, in your memoir writing? I know Stephanie mentioned that, Carol, you had a good story about that. So I'd love to hear that story. Um, I'm not sure about that because it was, it, I, I don't think I insulted anybody in the book, <laughs> but I have heard that um, people who have written memoirs have had uh, terrible family uh, arguments uh, when they uh, disclose certain personal information about somebody. My particular memoir, uh, I didn't have that problem, but I think Stephanie had mentioned that if she thought that it might hurt somebody or insult somebody, that you just make a composite character or just change the name. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably the best bet. I mean, most people, you know, if you're writing about something that's really um, terrible, although I, I have to tell you, there was this woman in the music industry actually, who I met her last year and she wrote a book. It was like a Me Too movement type book. And she just annihilated everyone. Like everyone in her book, she used names and she went to town. And I was like, I couldn't do that. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, the stuff that I wrote about, I'm very comfortable using the names, um, you know, my husband, you know, my dad, and, you know, some of my Carol's in the book, Steve Harkavy, her husband's in the book. But um, if it's if it's something so, I mean, but it was with the intention to expose them. So, I mean, I guess it all depends and you have to weigh, you know, what, what again, it goes back to what is your message and what are you trying to get out there? And in her case, her message was to expose these men. So I guess that was her, her way of uh, doing that, so. Great, thank you both. Um, so uh, a couple of people had written in with something that I thought really touched on memoir writing. Uh, and someone asked, I'm always surprised by how much people reveal, especially when it involves others. Do you have any guiding principles for balancing bearing one's soul for posterity with taking painful events to the grave, so to speak. Carol, do you want to remark first and I'll follow up or how do you want to do that? <laughs> Let me go first. 
<laughs> I, I sort of was, I, I happened to look at one of the chats and I missed some of the gist of the question. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, in terms of being, um, writing being cathartic, I think writing out everything is extremely important. And I think that's where you start. I think as you edit the book, you realize, like I said, the passage that I had about those doctors didn't need to be in there. Um, it was more of my um, personal, I guess, opinion. It was taking away from the book and it wasn't, it wasn't necessary. Um, you know when, it's, when it crosses a line, I think. And, um, but, but that being said, it is really important to tell your story. If you don't tell your story, then there are other people out there that are suffering that need to connect with you and your story, and they're not able to do that if you hold back too much. So um, my recommendation is always write everything and then have your beta readers or whoever's reading it, whoever you trust that's going to read that, um, take a look at it and say, you know, maybe that's too much or maybe I wouldn't go in that direction. That would be my advice. Well, yeah. Now, uh, I, I did get the gist of the question and now it's sinking in. Um, <laughs> but what I, I gave the manuscript to about eight people who I knew. Nobody knew my mother and none of them were relatives. And I asked them to read the book. And that very last part that I read, that every time I read it, I must have read it a thousand times, and of course I wrote it, but every time I read about that recreation of my being by my mother's coffin, I, I start to cry. In the beginning, of, in, in the original manuscript, that came at the beginning. And one of the uh, readers who was kind enough, Renee Robbins, I don't know if she's here tonight, but she read it and she said, you know, Carol, that was very powerful. But I read it and I felt almost as though I was eavesdropping on somebody's very personal uh, and emotional time. And she said, I think that if you put that at the end, it will make a lot more sense because by that time I will have gotten to know who Rosie was. I would have gotten to know her humor, her, just, just the sort of person that she was. And I would have been able to handle it better at the end. And that's where I put it. I took her advice and I think it is much more effective there. So having uh, outside readers, in fact, I think that was one of the questions from our, one of our um, uh, uh, writers groups, mother is uh, as far as editing the book. And it's, it's important to get some objective readers, as I said, people who don't know the, the, the topic, who really don't know you even that much, and just get some of their feedback on how they felt the book should go. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, so we had a question for Carol, specifically from Eileen, who wanted to know, when you were writing your memoir, uh, what did you want uh, the meaning or theme to be beyond the relationship between a mother and her daughter? Well, that's, that's very interesting because the, the memoir is really twofold. It's obviously the strong relationship that I had with my mother. That goes without saying. But the other thing is that my mother was afflicted with severe rheumatoid arthritis when she was 28. And it progressively got worse to the point where toward the end of her life, she couldn't walk, she couldn't see. She really couldn't, she couldn't cook, she couldn't hold a pot and pan. And when she was younger, I was told by her childhood friends that she was the most vivacious and, and energetic of all of her friends. And when this afflicted her, instead of kind of sequestering herself and feeling sorry for herself, she learned to adjust to whatever came her way. She was always optimistic. She was always happy. She was always concerned about other people. And I wanted to show the, the spirit and the optimism that she had. Um, I wrote in the blurb of the book in the back, 
Rosie comes of age in the roaring 20s, as felt and lively as any flapper, she has everything, brains, looks, energy, and wealth. Her life unfolds as a metaphor of this period, the era of the booming 20s where the sky's the limit and there is no place to go but up, crashes in 1929. Simultaneously, Rosie's dreams crumble. Both the country and Rosie must deal with their new realities. Soon thereafter, still early in life, Rosie is beset by an unremitting stream of physical disabilities that will continue to accumulate throughout the remainder of her life. Not one to surrender to adversity, Rosie reveals an indomitable spirit that is fueled by sheer courage and extraordinary mental strength. So yes, the book is twofold. And it's very funny when I wrote the book and I said, gee, I wonder if anybody asked that question, if I'd be able to answer it. And this was a couple of years ago. And just, just absorbing and the, the content of, of, of my book, this is really what this book shows. Yes, I had a great relationship with my mother, which I think is a good lesson for, for other women who are fortunate enough to still have their mothers. But it also shows the power of optimism and the desire to be happy no matter what befalls you. Great, thank you so much, Carol. Um, so I think a couple of these questions uh, both of you had touched on, but if you wanted to add anything additional around um, how you kind of, how you get started writing chronological versus thematic, outline versus um, just organizing it later, um, from what Stephanie and you both had said earlier, you kind of inspired to say, uh, like, try everything, whatever kind of helps you get your story onto the page. Do you have anything you want to add in, in terms of getting started with writing? Sure. Um, I just write, them up. I just start writing my feelings. You know, I just started writing my feelings, but uh, Stephanie, you have a more organized... Oh. It's, it's not necessarily more organized. I mean, I've, I've been to Carol's house and I've seen all her journal entries and I'm like so jealous of it. But um, with me, it's like, I, I have to, um, I usually use technology. So I usually hop on a Google doc and I just start writing. Um, but once I determine if I need to, you know, organize it a certain way, like I might just pick one journal and go with that or, um, I might keep keep it in a Google Doc and just write journal entries there. So, I mean, again, it's really something that's very personal to everybody because the last thing you want to do is try a writing technique and be like, this is boring. I don't want to do this and then walk away from it. So that's why I think if you try everything, there's one thing that's like, that works. I know, um, there, there's at least one person on here where the vision board on the wall works the best. And that, that is something that a lot of people um, like to do because they like to see it in front of them. I know at least one other person where the, the Google document um, as a vision board works the best. And, and so I think it really is important to, to try everything. Um, also just a quick note, because not a lot of people know this about Carol and I, but um, my mom's name was Roseanne and her mom's name was Rosie. Both of their birthdays were April 5th. So we are like cosmically connected as well. Um, so, it, and it's really cool because we both lost our moms. We both wrote about that. They both were named Rose. They both had the same birthday. So there's definitely a cosmic connection. I needed to throw that out there because we didn't mention it. Uh, but no, that's a, that's a great segue into our next question from Aviva. Hi, Aviva. I was wondering how both your mother's lives would have potentially been different had they both been young in the 21st century? That's a good question. Carol, do you wanna go first or do you want me to go first? Well, Aviva has the very special distinction of being my first grandchild named for my mother. So she, even though she never knew my mother, has this, as you say, cosmic connection with her. Aviva, I think that it wouldn't have mattered much to my mother which century she was born in if her life unfolded the way it did. 
if she developed this uh, the, this uh, myriad of diseases and the illnesses that she had, I think that the important thing would be not the century that she developed this, but how she would have handled it. And just knowing how her personality was, I think that she would have been just as positive. In fact, when this pandemic started, I put down on my Facebook that uh, during this time, I don't have it, so I can't read it, so I'll have to add a little bit. But during this time of uncertainty, a lot of the messages that my mother could give would be beneficial to those of us who are dealing with this frustration, disappointment. People who were supposed to get married and couldn't. Uh, uh, all of these things that happened because of this pandemic. And yet in her life, she had these outside forces that prevented her from doing a lot of the things she would have loved to have done. And um, I think the lesson to be learned is that no matter what the negative force that we have, we have the choice. In fact, I just finished reading a memoir by a woman who wrote it when she was 90 years old. So I'm just a spring chicken when it comes <laughs> to that. <laughs> she wrote this memoir when she was 90 years old. She had been in the Holocaust, she was very accomplished. She's a PhD, she's a psychotherapist. And she said that bad things will happen to you in your life. And the most important thing is how you handle them. And the name of her memoir is called The Choice. And so we have a choice. You're gonna have these bad things. The pandemic is gonna come. You may uh, lose your job. You may not be able to go to Atlantic City of Viva, for instance, <laughs> where I take you every summer. But we have the choice on whether we view this, that we're a victim and no woe is me, or we're just gonna handle it, we're gonna circumvent it, and we're going to be happy no matter what. And you know, that's, that's a lot of what my memoir is about, is making that choice too, and making the choice to not be a victim and to keep going, even through tragedy. But it's funny, when I think about my mom, and if you knew my mom and you're on here, she was way before her time. I mean, she was just this, she was like a magical being, like before her time. But she really was um, so passionate about, you know, um, standing up for, for, you know, being this creative artist and being free and, and um, even like, I remember she told me like, she was like the first woman to like wear pants back in high school. So I think if she was in this time, I feel like, I feel like she would still be like that, but it would be accelerated to um, the next future wave. Like that was just her soul. She was a uh, super um, progressive, like very like, just before her time, like that's all I can say. And so, um, and she knew things and it was so crazy. Like she would know things that just like other people didn't know. And I'm like, are you an alien? Um, I don't know, it was just crazy, but like she was so cool um, in that way. And so, uh, yeah, I think she would have felt a little bit more um, like fit in a little bit more growing up in the 21st century. Uh, just because of how she was but I also think it was just her nature to be like beyond that so she probably would have still not fit in and <laughs> probably would have fit in in the next generation so uh, that's what I could say about my mom. <laughs> Fantastic thank you um, so I think that we have covered most of the things I think we have time for about one last question Eileen had another great one so Carol especially has mentioned uh, reading other memoir writers so for both of you, what is your favorite memoir? I saw, I, I, that's the question that I think distracted me from your question. <laughs> I was trying to think. There are so many. I mean, um, the, the, the diaries that we read, the diary of Anne Frank, uh, Tuesdays with Maury, where the student visits his uh, dying uh, teacher. Um, there are just, uh, so many and um i don't know what my I, I did just really enjoy reading this one called the choice which is by a uh person named edith eggers e-g-e-r-s and as i said she published it when she was 90 
And uh, so, so there are just so many, and I enjoy each and every one of them because I, I, I put myself into that writer's shoes and I, and I just feel, I know, I know the feelings and the connection that that author has had with the person that they're writing about. Stephanie, what's your favorite one? Besides, wait a minute, Stephanie. Besides, oh, obviously it's Rosie and me. Obviously. Um, but besides that, um, you know, what's funny is that you mentioned Diary of Anne Frank. I'm like, that was a good one. Oh, man, you threw me off. But um, but I liked Wild. That was that was pretty crazy. That was one of the good ones, you know. So um, and this story is just insane. But I, I really like that one. So I'm going to yeah. stick with that. There is a number that I forced all of my kids to read. And um, I even recommended it on, on Facebook. It's not a full length uh, book, but it is an essay and it was written by Helen Keller. And I yeah. said, all of you read it. It's called Three Days to See. And in it, Helen Keller imagines what it would be like to have just three days to see. And she talks about how we cannot take anything for granted in life that only the blind can appreciate that they had sight at one time. Uh, only when you become sick do you appreciate being healthy. I know for me, uh, I know not having a headache <laughs> uh, is so wonderful when I get one of my migraines. So um, I strongly recommend that well, that essay to you. It's available online if you just type in Helen Keller, Three Days to See. It's about a 12-page essay, and I strongly recommend that. Also, I yeah. just want to remark that Carol lent that to me to read, and then COVID happened, and so I still have her copy, and it's like <laughs> preserved because it's an old book, so I don't want anyone to touch it. So it's like preserved at my desk. So anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> So Carol, now you know where that book is. Yeah. Stephanie has it. <laughs> um, so I saw Stephanie dropped her contact information in the chat, but um, how can people reach both of you if they'd like to talk more about writing groups, getting started with writing? How can people reach you? Sure. Um, I'll go real quickly since I had uh, put that stuff in there. First of all, thank you to everybody. You guys have been great. Your questions were great. And I really, really am excited to see the journey that you take and you can always contact me. My email is, is in that chat there um, and let me know how you're doing because I, I love to see how you guys are doing. Um, and you can also connect with me um, on my website. All of my books are available on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com or um, you know Kindle and things like that. And of course you can connect with Facebook. So those are probably, Facebook and Instagram are the same. So if you are on those uh, social, apps you can connect with me both those ways i love hearing from people so please don't hesitate and my email is uh, carol harkavy at yahoo.com very original and i think that uh, dina has mentioned that i do have a website that was created by aviva <laughs> uh, and it's rosie uh .com. so we would love to hear from you Fantastic. So um, I just want to say thank you to both Carol and Stephanie um, for sharing your story, for sharing your expertise with everyone. Thank you for everyone um, coming out and joining us tonight. Uh, please let your friends know this has been recorded. It'll be uploaded to the Cherry Hill Public Library YouTube channel. Um, we do have Carol's book in our local author collection at the library. I hope if any of you have been inspired and you are publishing your own books that you'll donate a copy to the library. We'd be happy to place it on the shelf next to Rosie and me. Um, so again, have a lovely night. Thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you for uh, tuning into the Cherry Hill Public Library for all of our events that we have going on. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank, thank you. you.